Okay, off we go. Right, so um, hi everybody. Thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, I hope everybody's well. Um, as you can see, I'm in my office. You can see with the books behind. I'm sure we're all uh, adjusting to a new reality. Um, but anyway, hopefully we can uh, have a productive hour where we talk about some some techniques for teaching uh, high-level <coughs> high IELTS. So I'm going to talk about quite a few things. Um, some of the approaches that I use um, for teaching IELTS at different levels, but particularly high levels, and also um, some particular techniques and activities. Please do uh, email me if you want slides from this presentation afterwards. I'll be happy to share it. Um, and I'll put the email address up at the end as well, if you haven't got it now. Okay, so let's let's get going. So, so if you don't know why I'm talking to you, I am the author of this book on IELTS, which is called Build Up to IELTS. Uh, it's published recently, it's from Delta, um, and I'll like, talk about that a little bit more. And I also am the co-author of this writing book that's been around for about 10 years that some of you may have tried. So yeah, I'm just going to share some of the ideas that have informed what's in the books, really. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is basically an approach to IELTS teaching. And this really is for any level, doesn't matter if it's low level, high level, mid. Um, but this is really something that I believe works and is really effective. So um, I think that whatever you're doing with IELTS, whether it's reading or listening um, or, or writing or whatever it is, you should build up the tasks in a step-by-step -step way. Um, even if it's an advanced level class, which I teach quite a lot and I'm teaching at the moment, um, the approach would be that you guide students through each part of the test in small steps. Um, and you work focus on the technique and the approach and then you build it up. Um, I think this is particularly effective in reading, but I'll look at it for other things. Um, so I just wanted to show you um, an approach to teaching uh, true, false, not given part of reading and the way that I do it. Don't start even an advanced class with a full text. Here is um, a text that I wrote. This will be my first exercise for teaching true, false, not given questions, um, even in advanced classes. Uh, if you'd like to have a look, this is my first text, okay? You can try right, um, answering the questions in a minute, but just have a quick read through for a second. So why am I doing this? Well, firstly, this is all true. Everything in this text is true. If anybody's been to Cordoba, um, you'll know what I mean. It's a beautiful place. This was my first job. Um, so it's a bit more personal. But secondly, what I'm really trying to do with this is develop the student's technique. Um, I find that students at advanced levels will tell me that they find true, false, not given quite difficult, um, particularly the, the false, not given issue. And I think if you don't develop the technique early on or on basic text, you're not going to get anywhere. So what I do is I get a text like this and I then go through the technique that I'd like them to develop and I'll show you here. Uh, if you'd like to just read this briefly, just see if you use the same technique as I do, but this is what I do. Okay, so I, I walk the students through these set of steps. Um, you know, you can elicit it from them first, depending on how, on the class or whatever. But this is the technique that I would like them to apply. And as I said, if you want the slides from this, I'll give you it afterwards. Um, so what I then do is I show them exactly, we do the first question together, and I show them exactly how I'd like them to write on the questions or on the question paper. I don't know if you do this yourself, but certainly how I do it. 
and I just this would be on my board. Um, and the the annotation here is T1 is the, is the main topic I want them to look for. T2 is the second thing to look for. And the D there uh, above 18 months is the detail that proves the answer being true or false, or whatever in this case true. Um, and although this very simple question in a way, the focus on the technique and building up is really effective. Um, you, I, I've sometimes walked into advanced classes and given them this text and explained what I was doing and had about 30 seconds of, isn't this a bit easy? But actually it's not, they see the point. Um, so it's about that step-by-step -step building up technique, getting confident with it, and then going through a set of more challenging steps that we're going to talk about now. Okay, so if you would like to have a go, you can have a go at these questions and see if you can get the answers correct. I'll give you a minute. Finished. So um, I would have the students be doing this with the technique. Um, answers are true, number one. Number two is true because of my first teaching job. Number three is false because up to 48. And if you've ever been there, you'll know what that's like. Um, number four is true because seven days matches a week. Uh, number five is not given because people dress in flamenco and doesn't say that I did. And question six, when I'm teaching this in a class, I often, in a previous lesson, will mention the fact that I do speak good Spanish and I did live in Cordoba, just to see if the students will equate outside of text knowledge or to being true, or they'll make it not given, which is what it should be. So this would be my, my approach to teaching reading, and not just for true, false, not given, but anything. Start with a small text, even advanced classes, and then, Apply that technique to a medium sized text, and if possible, try and make the text and the, the topics quite interesting. One of the things that I was really keen to do in build up to IELTS is to try and include text that I actually wanted to talk about myself and students were interested in. So, this one is about happiness lessons in schools, um, which is, is quite an interesting idea. So I would then apply uh, that text there uh, and do the same thing. Uh, we won't go through these questions, but it's the same idea. Take the same technique that you've started with, you apply it to a slightly larger text. Uh, it's not as easy as it seems because you've got to be really accurate and careful, but that's what you want, isn't it, in this type of exercise. Following step is a slightly larger text. Again, this is a text that I wrote, this is about um, testing and is testing the best way to assess students or are there other alternatives? Um, and then you, of course, move on to the real thing at a certain point um, from a practice test from the Cambridge book. And it has to be that way, A, for authenticity, because you want to do the real thing rightly, and B, for the challenge of the real thing. But what I've found over the years um, is that if you do this approach, start the technique small, and build it up. Students get confident. Um, even high level students will have trouble with reading techniques. There's no question. Even if they've got great language level, that's a different issue, isn't it? I've my experience is that you set, you then send those students into a reading exam or a reading text or doing this one, uh, ready to just attack the text and have a go with a strategy and a confidence. And I've done it hundreds of times and it works. So I think that's the approach that I think is really nice to do, a little step-by-step -step building up confidence over, over levels, right from beginning levels to, to advanced. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to something else. Now, something else I'd like to talk about is some ways of generating ideas and inputting vocabulary for writing. And I'm gonna focus specifically on higher levels here, but the principle applies everywhere. I'm gonna look at three different things. One is um, to encourage you to write your own texts. Um, I might put myself out of business if I do that, but um, 
I've been doing this for a long time, even before I even vaguely thought about writing a book. I often found IELTS text in books fine, but maybe not for my class. I wanted to choose uh, a topic and vocabulary and language that I really wanted to input to my particular learners. So I started writing my own texts. I'm going to show you a template of how you can do this very easily in a second. Similar thing I'm going to talk about in a moment is making recordings to do the same thing, and I'll come to that. And then a little brainstorming technique for ideas at the end of this section. So, writing your own text. So what I mean is that you write a text with the aim of using that text um, to essentially input language for an essay. And of course, you could use a lot of that language for the speaking, uh, particularly part three, but whatever part. Um, because the structure of an essay in IELTS, are, you know, it's fairly simple, isn't it? Particularly at high level, once you've worked out how many paragraphs and what you're looking for, how do you go higher? How do you get the seven plus? It's really about the language and content and particularly, I think, the vocabulary. And I'll talk about grammar as well in a moment. So my template would be, I choose an essay question. So I see an essay question in the book about, I don't know, uh, prison and community service, for example. And I think it works nicely with texts if you arrange it around um, an advantage, disadvantage or a discussion essay, possibly, because then you can have a kind of balanced text. And I tend to think of, take four ideas. So if it was prison and crime, you know, two, two ideas or two reasons why it's a good thing sending people to prison and two reasons why it's not. Then just write the text with four paragraphs. OK, and one idea each and a really nice way of doing this, a kind of um, interview kind of tech works. Imagine that you're, you've got four people that are interviewed, giving their ideas about this and you write what you think they would say. You can actually do it by asking friends and colleagues. Go into your teacher's room. Uh, or into a Zoom room and say, right, so what do you think? How give me your ideas about prison? And you brainstorm those and you turn them into four paragraphs. And we're not trying to create a reading text like the reading text. We're trying to create a text that students can work on for language. Um, practice reading skills at the same time. So let me show you an example. So you can make this into a lesson uh, this way. So you choose an essay topic and students discuss it. And I'll show you a practical example in a moment. Uh, the students then read the four paragraph texts and potentially write a heading for each one. What's it about? So it's just a kind of skim reading, quick reading. You might want to cut the text up, put it around the classroom, so on. I then quite often try to make some kind of IELTS reading task and something like um, which paragraph contains the following information works nicely here because you've got four paragraphs of different pieces of information. Once they've done that, so they've processed the text for meaning and a little bit more detail they can extract some vocabulary from the text, write bits of exercises to find similar phrases and so on. And then students can use that vocabulary in a speaking task. Um, and of course, then input it into the writing at the end. So let me show you a practical example of how I've done this. So here's an essay question. This is the one I was talking about. So very straightforward, students read the question, talk about it, give their opinions. You might want to upgrade or correct some of their language if you want to do. Um, and then we go to the text, which I'll show you in a moment. And there are two tasks, as you can see. Um, this is all from build up to I up. So firstly, you read the four interviews, write the heading, as I mentioned. Then you have this exam task here. Um, which is the which paragraph contains the following information. Okay, so that's the task set. Here is the text. Um, have a little look. You can see the style that it's written in, but you can also see if you if you look at one of the paragraphs, the type of vocabulary that I've tried to input. Just have a quick look.
Okay, so if we were to look at just very briefly at paragraph A, you'd see things like prison is a deterrent potential criminals. We've got commit a serious offence. You've got think twice before committing a crime. Uh, more effective in deterring crime behind bars, and so on and so on. And I've selected this these allocations and chunks because I think they'd be nice for my advanced level students. And I want an essay that is going to contain a phrase such as some people believe that prison is a deterrent to potential criminal. This is this is really nice, I think. Okay, so next page is you have the students extract their vocabulary in this manner. Um, so question one here in exercise four is obviously it's a deterrent to criminals. Um, they can then use that vocabulary in speaking. As you can see at the bottom of the page here, we've got some speaking questions to practice that language a bit and personalize and talk about how you feel. And the final stage is that you write an essay. And you write an essay using the language and ideas that have been inputted. And for me, that this formula really, really works. And the nice thing is, once you've once you've done it once, if you've, if you've written your text, your activity, you've got it forever, basically. And the other thing is that uh, you can adjust it because it's your text. You can make it slightly more difficult or slightly easier depending on the level of the class. You can add in more language if it's higher level classes. Okay, so I highly recommend that. Um, now, here's another thing that's quite similar in terms of the rationale, and this is about making your own audio recordings to input ideas and vocabulary, again, for writing, but of course you could do it for speaking as well, and combine them. Now, all I mean is, you basically, I'll explain in a moment how to do it, and I'll play you a little bit of one, is that you, you take an essay topic, and you um, think about what you're doing, but you, you make a recording with a colleague um, inputting the language and the ideas that you want the students to learn. Very easy to do, you don't have to script it at all. Uh, you can of course control the input and grade it. And again, it's a ready-made lesson for life. So the way I would do it is I take an essay title, plan out a few ideas and some vocabulary in advance and think about the vocabulary that I want to input. You might want to work with colleagues on it. Record a kind of semi-scripted conversation with a colleague of minutes. Okay, and fill it, pack it full of lexis and ideas and vocabulary, and that will really work. So, I'm going to play you a section of one that I did with my colleague Adam in the school that I work in in, in Portsmouth, and we, uh, I got we we sort of semi-scripted this one, and the topic, as you can see, is a problem-solution essay about cities. So I'm just going to find the audio here. I'm just going to play you. A little section of our of our dialogue, okay, and just have a listen and think about what is the language in here that is useful for students at an advanced level. Okay, go. Okay. So, what do you think about the main problems facing people in cities these days, and do you think there's anything that can be done to tackle them? So, I think if I think about London, for example, one of the big issues is traffic. Um, um, my sister lives in London and at rush hour um, there's a lot of traffic jams often and traffic congestion and it's quite difficult to get around. Um, in terms of solutions, well, I think one thing is you can bring in a congestion charge. Um, that's the system where you um, make people pay to drive in the centre of the city. Something else that can be done done is maybe to build more cycle lanes so that people can cycle safely instead of driving. Um, what, what do you think? Yeah, well, I completely agree with you. Um, I'm not an expert, but I'd have to say that I think one of the foremost problems from all of the traffic is the air pollution that comes from it. Yeah, right. And I think if the government implemented um, new regulations and restrictions yeah. on uh, commuters so that they maybe turned off their engines and things when they got to traffic lights. That would definitely improve <laughs> the situation. Okay. Um, and another issue I think in cities is the cost of living. Um, so, again, if I'm thinking about London, but I think it's the same everywhere, uh, the property prices are really high, even to rent. Um, I think it's really difficult for the average 
teacher or nurse, whatever, to even afford to rent in London. Um, any solutions for that one, do you think? I'm really not sure. I mean, I think this is a problem that affects everybody. Mm. I, I mean, I myself find it quite difficult to find something affordable to, yeah. to rent in big cities, and I don't think I could live in a big city um, like London. Yeah, right, right. Um, I read something about in Germany, they have a system of rent caps. So there's a maximum price when you rent a, a flat per month that the government um, enforces. So maybe that's that's what the way forward. Um, and the other problem, I think, or one of the other problems is if the public transport, um, particularly if it's kind of inefficient or expensive, is that your experience, public transport in big cities? Yeah, it is, um, especially in the UK. I think that other countries sometimes have um, really good systems for commuters mm. where you can kind of pay maybe a flat rate yeah, right. and, and travel anywhere in the city or something like that. Yeah, whenever I'm in London I feel like it's really expensive to get around on the tube so maybe maybe the government could you know subsidize the fares a bit more or just make it a bit cheaper for people to travel. So, you know, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The fares okay, a bit great, more thanks. More. Um, I'd love to get people's thoughts at the end of this on that, but um, as you can see, that wasn't completely scripted and professional, but what it was, was full of all sorts of things, congestion charge, rent caps, building cycle lanes, all sorts of nice vocabulary at the level that I'm, I'm, I'm aiming for, an advanced level. This is a really nice technique, I think. Um, you, you don't have to script it, you can just work on it. Um, and it's it's just quite nice. It's a nice listening as well. So I recommend doing that. Um, and the other thing you can follow up that task with is once you've worked on the vocabulary, is have the students do some speaking practice connected to speaking part three. So if you were to look at the questions here, they're very all the language comes from that recording. Uh, so for example, you hear, do you agree with introducing a congestion charge? So recycle the vocabulary, use it in speaking next writing and speaking part three okay so that's that now brainstorming uh now here's a nice nice thing excuse me so sometimes i think it's quite nice just to get students to work on um brainstorming ideas really quickly no matter what the level just to get them used to that thing in an exam where i have to do it in two minutes so a nice way of doing this is students uh you give them two dice or if you don't have any, you just get them to pretend. You do fake dice and roll a fake dice, and that's quite nice. And you give them two, two sets of six. You get them, uh, I'll show you. You get six essay questions, as you can see here. And you get six times. And you then work in pairs or small groups, and you roll the dice twice. If I roll a three first time, I have to talk about the causes of stress. Um, which we could talk about quite a lot at the moment, I think. And if I then roll a six, I have to do that for three minutes. And when I'm working with my partner, my partner has to write down my ideas uh, and maybe report back. So this is a really nice, this is not vocabulary generating necessarily, but it's a particularly nice ideas generation thing um, that works really nicely and the game element makes it fun. Okay, now I'd like to look at a little bit more about teaching grammar, uh, particularly for writing at higher levels. Um, and one of the great things I think everybody here will know is that what's really nice about high level, about IELTS as a kind of um, the criteria and the marking scheme, is that it rewards, and rightly so, range of grammar um, and taking risks. Um, if you want to get yourself a seven uh, for grammar, but for, you know, in general, you, you need to expand your range and you need to take a few risks with the grammar and try complex things, don't you? And I think that's great. So one of the questions is, which structures do we need to include in our teaching? Now, there are lots of different things. Um, but one of the things is then, once you've decided which ones, how do we teach it? It, it? it obviously can't be in the same way that you do in a general English course, where you look at form in, this, in, the, in, a, in a sort of decontextualized way, perhaps. You have to really functionally tailor it so that it goes straight into the writing. Something I've been working on for about 15 years in different ways. I'm going to show you some examples of how that's done in a second. So, which structures to include? There's lots, 
Right, I want to show you this. Um, I've picked seven purely so that I can use the phrase the magnificent seven. Um, if there's a similar phrase for 10, um, please tell me what it is at the end. Um, but you could, there's lots of different pieces of grammar, but the key point of this slide is the part in the brackets. So conditionals, yes, but for what? Conditionals for explaining things. Uh, first conditional perhaps for explaining your topic sentence. Uh, second conditional for explaining solutions and consequences of solutions. Um, and for each piece of grammar, I think it's really important to think about what function it's going to, to um, be, what you're going to do with it, uh, which part of writing it's going to be for. So for example, three, the present perfect, recent changes in trends, most likely an introduction of an essay, right? Uh, not only, but also most likely your second paragraph of advantages where you go back and repeat the first one, if you know what I mean. So I think the pick, pick the grammar structures and then think about the function. So let me look at uh, just a couple of these. I'm going to look at relative clauses here. Oops. Yes, so I think it's really important to isolate and tailor the grammar that you're using. To, to the writing function that you're doing, okay? And, and that sounds a very complicated thing, but all I mean is, what are we using it for? If I'm teaching relative clauses, one of the functions that you need in writing is a relative clause at the end of a sentence to kind of comment or evaluate on the statement in the first part, okay? And a simple way of doing it is just to expose some examples, do some practice, show how you can use it in writing. So I'll talk you through it. So here are three examples of relative clauses for comment and evaluation. Just have a quick look. All right, so we show the, the students these examples. You might also isolate it even a little bit further to say that you know, there are a particular range of verbs that tend to be used in these kind of relative clauses. Um, you might have more to add, but is, is the sort of most common ones. Then we give some students some example sentences to have a go at. Start with the pair, write down the end of the sentence. Okay, so they complete that relative clause with a suitable comment, evaluation, or consequence, whatever it is. We can then compare it with the teacher's own version. Have a look. You can also include some nice Lexis, such as get onto the property ladder, as you can see here. So have a quick look. And that then leads to essays that come back with beautiful relative clauses for evaluation and comment because you spelled it out and showed them how to do it. And I think that's really important. If it's just some work on relative clauses and now an essay, it's very difficult to transfer. Um, I'll show you one more example of what I mean. Um, again, this is from Build Up to IELTS, but it's um, I've also had something similar in IELTS Advantage. Uh, again, so here's something that's quite nice. So the grammar of unless and otherwise, again, what's a, what's, what's a function? It's, well, conclusions, I feel. I feel that you, we use these kind of things at the end of an essay to say basically, unless we do X, the problem's going to get worse, or we need to do Y, otherwise it's going to get even worse. The really simple lesson, mini lesson structure here, you isolate the language and show examples. We've got two examples here in the grey box. Um, I like to do it with some kind of guided discovery questions for students. So get them to work together on the grammar, you know, what follows otherwise, what follows unless, what's the position in the sentence, all of those kind of things. Okay, so you, they do that. And then we can do a little bit of controlled practice in the first exercise here. So it's just transformations, essentially. It's kind of FCE, CE type transformations, just to make sure they're doing it and practicing it. Uh, maybe a little bit of a freer practice in the last exercise. Again, you, it's connected to speaking part three, isn't it? You're giving opinions and it's, it, it kind of works. Um, and then maybe the last stage is if you 
give them a conclusion, for example, where with one of the structures, so here it's obviously unless, you just ask them to take that sentence out, rewrite it with otherwise, um, to give it the same meaning. So it's completely contextualized and narrow, and that kind of works very nicely too. So that's, that's, that's part of the approach to grammar, I think. Uh, one more thing about grammar before I move on, which is, I don't know what you call this, but I like to call it mini grammar, little bits of grammar that wouldn't find necessarily in a grammar book, students maybe don't even consider to be grammar, but I suppose they are, or maybe perhaps they're colligations, I'm not really sure. Uh, but here's an example, um, and particularly for writing this one, of course. So instead of, now we know that that works with instead of plus gerund, um, but it's also nice to teach the functions. So if you look at these three sentences, they are three slightly different functions of instead of plus ing. Have a quick look. If we were speaking face to face, I'd ask you to shout out what you think. Okay, so I would say these functions are facts or changes, introduction perhaps, uh, comparing two alternative options in the second one, and potentially with the addition of a should. Uh, giving opinions about things that you would think alternative and things that would should could be better than they are now. So three really separate functions of a, a little piece of language, really clear to students if you isolate it like that. Um, you can give them some kind of controlled practice like this, where you just give them the key chunk of language and then they have to write those sentences. Um, and all they do is have to write, instead of writing letters today, people tend to communicate by email text. Type or Zoom, I should add now. Okay, so that's a kind of mini grammar that I've got loads of those in my published material, but I just think it's a nice concept and it, it just translates straight into the next essay and it works. Right, I'm going to um, look at some work on Lexis and vocabulary, okay, at high levels. And again, I really like what's required in IELTS here. It's one of the reasons that's kept me teaching it for so long. Uh, sort of 20 years or so, is because I think this is a really interesting area. So if we need to, if you want to get a seven in task two or in general in the writing, you have to do these two things, right? These come from the criteria. It's great, right, isn't it? You need, you need range, you need flexibility and precision, and you need some less common items with style, it should be style and collocation, sorry. Wow, so it's part of our job then at high levels to introduce that language. Now, you'll see that I already did that a little bit um, through the text, through the reading, through the listening, as we've already discussed. Um, and as an approach, I think it's really important point two here to integrate uh, the writing and the speaking so that you're reinforcing and connecting the vocabulary and extra practice. Another option is that you use model essays um, at I plus one, so in other words, one level above where the students are, that's another option. Um, and, another, and something I really, really like is doing reformulation and upgrading of students' writing, um, which we'll talk about in a second. Now, another thing you can do, if you're integrating the speaking and part three and the writing, is to sketch out for yourself, and again, this works nicely with, in collaboration with a colleague, you, you look at a, an essay topic connected to a speaking topic, and you think, what phrases would I like to input to my students? I know my class, I know what they can do, I know the vocabulary they do have. What vocabulary can I add? What can I put, give, them, give them extra? Um, and you can anticipate this, I think, and with experience, it will always, it, you, you, you'll kind of know. So I kind of try and sketch out um, a list of vocabulary and chunks and phrases and collocations and, and mini grammar things for a topic um, before a lesson, and then I teach it. And one of the ways I do that, I'll show you my, my board. I hope you can see that okay.
So this works nicely if you prepare it in advance. If you have a smart board, then obviously it's a lot easier than this low-fi whiteboard, but I quite like low-fi whiteboards because they've got lots of space on them. And I'd write this up maybe before the class began. And what you can see is I've given them loads of chunks and phrases that I think that they will need. And at the same time, I've given them some, some hints. So for example, if we just take the first one at the top, the government could, we've got C blank and S blank, the price of uh, bus, tube, blah, blah, blah. And the hint being reduce or reduce a lot. So the answer being cut or slap. So I, I have the board here and I get the students to work in pairs or groups and see what they know, see how much they can come up with. Then I elicit all the language back onto the board from them. And we get this. We work on meaning, we work on pronunciation, we work, we drill the phrases. Sometimes there's grammar that pops up. You can see in the bottom left hand corner, we've got a sort of second conditional plus passive. If they did this, if this was done, and we can discuss the difference, so pieces of grammar can come in as well. Um, then this can go to a speaking activity where you discuss, you know, what are the main problems in cities and what are the solutions, and then you write your essay. So it's really straightforward. You sit down before a class, you think of some lectures the students don't know, but you want them to know. You, you make a board or you make a, a, an IWB, uh, you work on it, you practice it, and it, and it works. It's very nice. And of course, things will come up that you can all upgrade. Now, here's another thing. Um, upgrading and reformulation. What a beautiful thing, isn't it? Is That's kind of what we're here for. You, you, the student, can say this pretty well. I can show you how to say it a little bit more naturally, a little bit better, a little bit higher level. That's why you're here. So here are three sentences which I've had from students recently. Very nice. I'm not unhappy with these sentences, but um, I want them upgraded. And you can do this spontaneously, can't you? You can take it away and think about it. If it's from writing, you've got time with the piece of writing to take that piece of writing away, think about it, that's it maybe with a colleague, just think about how to upgrade it. I tend to upgrade it this way. So I take the original sentence in yellow, I give them my upgraded version, but I gap it and give them the first letter maybe. And then I give it back to the student get them to see if they can work out what they think it might be. Sometimes they can. Sometimes it triggers a, a memory of a word of the brain. Um, and if not, then I input it, drill it, that's it. So just for the record, we've got set a cap on the maximum rent. We've got a, in number two, a zero tolerance policy on. And in number three, we've got allocate more resources to. And a very simple follow-up stage is speaking practice. A few minutes, discuss those. You're using the new language. You might even get some more things to upgrade from that speaking. It's all that process of language-rich lexical input that we need at these high levels. Right, now I've just got five or 10 minutes and I'm gonna look at some ideas now for speaking. OK, and I'm going to look at some ways of improving students performance in the speaking uh, at high levels, but it's in, the principles here are in general. And I'm going to look at three things, for, one for each section of the, of the listening, uh, sorry, of the speaking. So for speaking part one, a little tiny example of how you can input grammar for specific questions. It goes back to what I said before, that teaching grammar functionally. Um, I'll come to the second. To the other two in a minute when we get there, um, but we're going to look at part two and part three. Starting with part one, here is the most common set of questions you get, right, in the speaking test. Doesn't matter what level you are, you're going to get these questions. So one way of improving students' performance in this is to, again, make some kind of recording, or this comes from Build Up to High Alps, where you've got kind of high level or you know, native speaker or native speaker level answers and the grammar that comes out of that can then be worked on. So I'm just going to just very briefly play you uh, two, two quick audios of two people answering these questions 
um, and just have a think about what grammar and tenses they're using because there's quite a lot. Okay, if you give me a second. Now. Excuse me a moment. Three. Okay, so here we go. So what do you think about the main problems facing people in cities these days? And do you think there's anything that can be done to tackle them? So apologies, apologies, hold on. Hold on. This one. Unit one, speaking. Exercises two and four. Do you work or are you a student? So, at the moment, I'm studying English in a language school. I have great teachers and I'm living with a great host family. How long have you been studying? I've been studying English for about three months and I've got one month left before I finish my course. What do you enjoy most about what you do? What I really like about studying English is that I've met lots of interesting people. For example, I have classmates from Asia, from the Middle East and from South America and it's been really interesting to get to know them. What did you do before? Before I came here, I worked as a shop assistant in a supermarket, but I decided that I wanted to get a better job, so I quit and I came here. I want to improve my English and pass the IELTS exam with a good score. What are your future plans? I'm planning to study at university in the UK. If I get good results in IELTS, I'll start an MBA in London in September. That's one. Is it me or does that guy sound slightly drunk? Um, Unit 8. Not. Speaking. Excellent. These come from Build Up to IELTS. I would sort of recommend you could re-record them if you like. Uh, so here's the other one. Different person, same questions. Unit 1. Speaking. Exercises 3 and 4. Do you work or are you a student? I work as a nurse in a local hospital. I specialise in caring for young children who are in intensive care. It's a great job. I really love it. How long have you been working? I've been working as a nurse for nine years. I worked for six years in a hospital in another city and I've been working in this job for three years. What do you enjoy most about what you do? What I really like about my job is that you can make a difference to people's lives. Obviously, when people come to hospital they feel very nervous and scared, especially children, and it's part of my job to reassure them that everything will be okay and that they will get better. It's quite a stressful job because you're dealing with some difficult situations, but I feel really privileged to help people, and when they're discharged from hospital feeling better, it's a wonderful feeling. What did you do before? When I finished school, I took a gap year and I travelled around Asia and Australia for about nine months. I worked for a few months on a farm in Australia and I visited lots of different places. Then, I spent three years training to be a nurse and, as I said, I've been working as a nurse now for nine years. And what are your future plans? Next year, I'm going to apply for a promotion to senior nurse. If I get it, I'll have more responsibility and, of course, more money, which will be great. Okay, so an awful lot of um, grammar in there, right? It's very simple questions, but if we were to analyse it, you've got all sorts of tenses, there's all sorts of grammar that you can get into, you've got a whole range of tenses, present perfects, different future tenses. And so one of the things you can do then is do some some grammar work so you can you could play it again with the grammar <coughs> gaps get them to put the right tense in discuss why um, you could also do some specific things where you look at you know differences between tenses but in the context of part one uh, so there's a whole set of different things here that you can do for future tenses present perfect pasts and so on um, and work on the grammar with your class. Maybe do some control practice with some typical kind of patterns and sentences that the students might use for their own kind of past, present and future. 
um, and then do it again. And I've found that you'll get your getting loads of grammar in in one go and at the same oops, sorry, and at the same time really really exposing them and showing them how to use it within the context um okay just a couple more things now inputting language for speaking part two okay this is another thing so here we go so here's okay there's lots of things you can do with speaking part two. it's great isn't it here's a typical question Again, I think making a recording is quite nice. I've made loads in build up IELTS and, and, and outside of that as well. Um, and then think about what it is that you want to, to work on. Okay, so I'm just going to play you briefly um, a recording of a person doing this. And I want you to think about what language uh, students could pick up from it. Okay, so just one moment. Just get that down. Here we go. Unit 8. Speaking. Exercises 2 and 3. I'm going to tell you about the city I enjoyed visiting, which was Barcelona. I went there last year on holiday for a week in June. I had been working for about six months without a break, and I was really tired so I decided it was time to get away from it all. The reason I chose to go to Barcelona was because my friend Matt, who was working there as a teacher, had invited me to visit him and said that he could put me up and that he could show me around the city and take me to the best places. It was the first time I had ever been to Spain, so I was really excited before I went and it was as fantastic as I thought it would be. One thing I really liked about Barcelona was the weather. It was baking hot all the time, and I really enjoyed strolling around the city in the sun, feeling the heat on my face and getting a tan. Another great thing about Barcelona was the food. On my first day, Matt took me to an amazing family-run restaurant where the home-cooked food was amazing and the service was really friendly. It was really good value for money as well. We left them a really big tip to say thank you for such a great meal. One of the highlights of my trip to Barcelona was seeing all the famous tourist attractions, like the Sagrada Familia and the Gaudí buildings. On the third day of my trip, Matt was working all day, so I decided to take a bus tour around Barcelona to see all the sights. I took loads of photos and I even picked up a few souvenirs to take home for my friends and family. As well as seeing the sights, I also spent a couple of days chilling out on the beach. It was great to sunbathe on the sand and then go for a dip in the sea every now and then. The sea was really warm and it was a great way to switch off from my job and everything I had to do in my everyday life. If I had to choose one thing that I enjoyed most about the holiday, it would be hanging out with my friend Matt. We hadn't seen each other for ages, and it was great to spend some time together and to catch up. So, that was a great holiday I really enjoyed. So, it's full of stuff, isn't it? There's Lexis, there's grammar, there's linking phrases, there's all sorts of stuff that you could do with that. Um, just from making that recording and again you can just kind of plan it a little bit and script it but um, I, I think I chose here to to focus firstly on the kind of transferable linking chunks I'm going to tell you about the reason I chose one thing I liked about it one of the highlights of my career that kind of thing there's also that functional grammar isn't it number seven here if I had to choose one thing it would be um, you can see that in the fourth exercise here, I've done a little bit of work on narrative tenses because obviously most speaking part twos deal with the past. Um, you could also pick out some of the Lexis. There was you up, family run restaurant, left a big tip, took a bus tour, all sorts of stuff. And then the students go back um, and they do some practice. It's all sorts of things that you can do based around a spoken model, thinking about what you want to do. with it. Right now, just two minutes to finish in part three. Um, now, this is an interesting thing, isn't it? Because it works in different ways. I feel that there are different lessons you can teach here. Um, one could be a lesson with a grammar focus. So there are so there are very often speaking part three questions with 
our future predictions you know what do you think will be the future of technology or the future of education you could work on a range of future tenses it's also a sort of question type thing isn't it how can something be improved there's a whole sort of function of passing improvements to cities or education or whatever and of course there's also topic specific vocabulary for the common topic so you could do a speaking part three like this where you picked out some future questions, you made a recording. I won't play it to you now, but there's, you know, in <clears throat> you, you could have a recording of this where people are using phrases like will and going to and in all likelihood and will be doing and will have done and all sorts of range of future chunks at a high level. You could similarly do this type of lesson. So you could enlist students what type of language you need for improvements and that's most likely to be things like wish or second conditionals or ethical structures or sort of reduce conditionals if that's what it's called it should goes at the beginning and again you could do a topic specific vocabulary where you recorded a, a part three um, and you packed it full of language about touring essentially what i'm saying about the, speaking at the high levels is uh, make recordings pick language out pick grammar out linking vocabulary practice it that way that for me works really well okay right i'm going to stop there um and i'm going to hand you over to to martin if if you have any thoughts or questions or anything to add i'd be delighted to talk about those a bit more um just say that's my email address there at the bottom of the screen please do email if you'd like slides or if you'd just like to get in contact and talk about IELTS. Um, I don't see many people these days so that would be quite nice. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Lewis, that's brilliant. I've got some questions from earlier. Um, okay. Just some, the, the technical one um, doesn't give a name, but what program did you use to record? Oh, to make the recordings, did you just do it on a phone with an app or? Yeah. Um, Either um, we have some dictaphones in the school, um, and I use those, um, and then you can just plug it in and save it, or yeah, sometimes just on the phone. To be honest, it doesn't have to be anything professional. Uh, it, it's good enough. The, the conversation I played earlier with my friend Adam about cities, that was on a mobile phone, I think. My mm -hmm. phone, and we just plugged it in and saved it like that. It's as easy as that. Actually, something I did when you were talking about the dice as well, having a dice, is... Um... You can get an app for that as well. I just looked it up. I wonder. I thought. I wonder if there's an app for that, and you can get a dice for your phone. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. That's not <laughs> <right>. <laughs> um, somebody else put, said, "What would you classify as uncommon vocab?" Which somebody else mentioned about being a different tier. But um, what would you classify as uncommon vocab? As in, in order to get the seven. Um, yeah. That's a very difficult question, isn't it? I think mm. it's. I think it's. It's for it's it, you're going into collocation, aren't you? And you're going into set phrases, and you're going into the territory of um, it's uncommon, but you know things like um, allocating more resources to, as opposed to spending more money on. Um, I think it's that awareness of uh, language that goes beyond what your average intermediate student will be able to produce. Spending more money on public transport, sure allocating more resources to that's another level isn't it it's yeah. all going to get I think, and i think one of the ways of doing that is just to sit down and talk it through and even actually you could just record on your phone having a chat with a colleague and see what you come up with that's one of the things that works for me good 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 there is um uh, uh, a comment here about what books would you recommend for students with academic writing lower and high level but perhaps if you just um, explain a little bit or just summarize because I've used your building up to IELTS with my IELTS students have you how yeah yeah how did it how did it go I well actually there was one student who I tried before about a year ago and I used your book and then they they passed okay really because they have big problems with the writing and I'd like you just to summarize how you have, how you use writing and the, the, the methodology and the, the method you use for improving students' level of writing 
in build up to IELTS? Yeah, so, and this is in build up to IELTS, but also in IELTS advantage is that one of the, goes back to what I said at the beginning of the, of the presentation, which is, um, I think it's about breaking it down into little chunks mm. and then building it up step by step. So if you're going to write an opinion essay, um, first step will be then, okay, how do we write an introduction? And then the step back from that is what kind of grammar would go into that introduction mm. and what kind of phrases. And then we need to practice those. So it's, you know, there's kind of several pages, sort of six to eight pages in each unit of build up to IELTS for writing at the beginning, where basically I start with a model essay, or a model answer for task one or task two, where you see the outcome. And then you sort of break it down into little bits and you build it up step by step, which is why it's step by step course. Yep. I, I found as a teacher in the past when I didn't do that, when I went too quickly, even at high levels, people didn't get it. They kept making the same mistakes. Um, and the idea of this book essentially is that you could teach it itself, really. You just go through the steps and you build them up to a higher level yep. um, one by one. Exactly. That's how, I mean, that's, that's what I found with students. You're, you're sort of like, it is that step by step holding their hand through and it does, it yeah. works. It's yeah. very, very good. Um, I've got something here, which um, is something I've come across lots, and I'm sure you have very advanced students who get eight or nines in speaking and listening and reading and only get a 6.5 in writing. All the time. Uh, yep. And, you know, what do you do? <laughs> um, well, I think, yeah, it's such a common pattern, isn't it? And particularly, yeah. particularly in the context where I'm teaching in the UK, uh, we, quite, we quite often have students who are essentially living here. You know, they, they might be, um, you know, they're not here for a few months to do a language course. Perhaps like they're a doctor or a nurse and they need to pass it. Their general English level is fantastic. But again, it's going back to building up step by step because what's missing is often the knowledge of how to put a paragraph together or, or the knowledge of uh, the range of grammar that you need to put in. I'm, I'm teaching at the moment a a doctor from Serbia is particularly exactly what you're saying um, and her speaking to eight it's brilliant. but when I looked at her writing for the first time I thought well the range of language here is quite narrow you're just using the tenses that you would use in speaking and you're not using them in, in a tailored and targeted way so I think it's about giving them exercises that target that grammar and that vocabulary um, and get it into that essay to to show what they can do because I think it's very difficult to do I mean if you ask someone who hasn't been trained they will get six or six point five and they do need to know how to use unless and otherwise in a conclusion and that that's something they should do I think it's that is is the, is the step forward and I've had a lot of success with that type of student in that way I'm talking there was a microphone yeah. thank you yes good and <laughs> i was muted sorry um good. mark ellis says he works successfully with the arts advantage series and he likes the method in all the series um people are saying thank you very much okay i think that's about all okay we'll we'll make a stop of it there <laughs> okay thank you very very much lewis that was brilliant very informative Oh, thanks. Thanks, everybody, for coming along. It's great to have so many people here. And please do get in touch. Yeah. Um, I will say a lot of you are asking for certificates. Um, if you can please contact me at info at delta publishing.co.uk. Let me just see. I've spelled it right. There we go. <coughs> if you contact me at info at delta publishing.co.uk. Um, we will make sure that you get a certificate. Please, if you can, um, make sure that you've signed up for our um, newsletter. Also, keep an eye on Facebook, Delta Publishing on Facebook, and also on Twitter, because we're going to be putting a lot of free materials for using online in the next few days because we know that lots of you are transforming your classes for this so we will be putting up more materials and there will be more um, webinars coming up 
also I will um, give information then about the recording of Lewis's webinar from today. I know some of you um, may have had some connection issues and had to come back in again, so missed parts of it. So you, there will be a recording of this and um, that will go up on the website. But if you keep in touch with us on Twitter and Facebook and also make sure you signed up for the, for the newsletter, which you can do on the website, which is deltapublishing.co.uk.